8,000 Palestinians have been murdered, killed in the arbitrary and endless bombardment of Gaza. Um, the only crime that the dead are guilty of is the fact that they were born Palestinian, in my opinion. The bombing continues as we speak, um, despite the United Nations voting to have a pause in the bombing so that humanitarian relief can be ent can be brought to the Palestinians. Unfortunately, about a couple weeks ago, the United States used its veto power uh, to go against any type of pause in the in the bombardment. Um, I'm sure you all know that it's been told many times by now that it's the food, water, basic necessities of life, fuel to keep generators operating in hospitals and ambulances from running out of gas is prohibited from entering Gaza and what fuel that is left is minimal at best and probably days until it runs out completely which will pose probably another catastrophic um, humanitarian crisis for those babies who might be in incubators for surgeries for ambulances trying to go and rescue those who need rescuing. Um, something also that hasn't been being reported, uh, has not been reported in the news, but I, I probably should first tell you that I am a Palestinian. Um, I was born and raised here, but my family is from the West Bank. Um, and so I, the news that I want to share is that apparently that there is actions that are being taken by the Israeli government now where they are arbitrarily arresting uh, people in mass in the West Bank. So the West Bank has also not been spared. And not only that, uh, settler violence that is being perpetuated by the settlers and protected by the Israeli uh, soldiers, uh, pro programs, as you will, um, they are going into villages now and it's being documented, uh, setting anything ablaze, killing, maiming um, Palestinians, uprooting olive groves that have been that have been passed down to generation for generation. Uh, so there is that going on, but of course uh, it's radio silence as far as what is happening. Um, so, then. Growing up as a Palestinian, what, what I see happening now, it, it's nothing new. The only thing new about it is, is the scale that it's, that it's being conducted on. But for the past 75 years, this is the reality that has visited the Palestinians day after day after day. Um, Gaza, since probably 2000, uh, has been routinely bombarded, you know, every few years. Um, in response to the Palestinians trying to defend themselves um, or exercising um, the right to be heard by simply amassing at the border in Gaza uh, a few years back on the March of Return, but was portrayed by the media as an attempted incursion into the Israeli proper. Over a thousand Palestinians died for simply protesting their right to return to their homes. Um, there was a non-violent uh, event that took place. So what is happening now is not being reported in the Western media, which may be no surprise to those who might be attending uh, this, this meeting tonight. Um, but, you know, the only thing I could say is the information is always out there, and there are many places to get information. Uh, seek those out. Uh, they're readily available, whether it's, um, I'll go ahead and make the plug, I guess. I mean, antiwar.com is a great website that has many articles on what's happening. Counterpunch is another resource. Um, Electronic Intifada is another source. Mondo Weiss is another source. There are many sources, uh, let, uh, you know, web magazines, if you will, Democracy Now!, that give you an, a great understanding of the true narrative of what is happening to the Palestinian people. Um, 
so yeah, without taking too much time, I'd pass it on to my uh, colleague, uh, Lena. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Riyadh, for sharing your experience and for, uh, for talking a little bit more about what the Palestinians are experiencing. And although mainstream media doesn't cover these things, I think it's really, really important that those of us who don't, may not necessarily have family um, at home who can tell you these things, arm yourself with knowledge. So a lot of these things, these um, places that Riyadh mentioned, I think are important to go to. I go to Democracy Now! every day religiously. They have people on the ground that are reporting. I go to Al Jazeera all the time. They also are a great source of knowledge. Um, I had learned a couple from Riyadh. So I think it's really important right now uh, that we arm ourselves with knowledge. Of course, it's really important to take self-care. I am going through media overload right now, and I can tell you right now, it's, always, it's not always the greatest place to be, but, you know, it's, it's a balance. You have to care for yourself, but at the same time, you, you can't shut your eyes. The world is no longer shutting its eyes to the murder that's going on in, in the occupied land of Palestine. I wanted to start off um, by some of the core issues that we have. Riyadh already touched about uh, over a couple of them, but I think that it's important for you and the community to arm yourself with knowledge. So when you uh, come upon other members in the community, when you come upon other people at your workplace, in the line at the checkout counter, and the topic comes up as it often does right now, we're facing a genocide, then you can arm yourself with what to say. Some of the central things that we as an organization are talking about um, is understanding also, like Riyadh said, that this is nothing new. This is not about what Hamas did just on October 7th, but this is about the Middle East. It's like a decades-long illegal occupation of Palestinian land and the denial of Palestinian human rights. In addition, the only way to permanently stop the violence is to end the occupation, which kills hundreds of Palestinian civilians every year and subjects more and more men and children to systematic racist oppression. You know, um, Riyadh said that he always has to erase the numbers, and I guess I'm always on pins and needles when you t talk about the numbers. 8,000, over 8,000 Palestinians dead, 3,500 of them are children. You know, it's important yourself. It's important to arm yourself with knowledge because the fact is that more children have been killed since October seventh than you know. Uh, it, it's basically the globe, the world's largest global loss of children within one year has happened since October seventh. So the world cannot return to the status quo in which Israeli human rights abuses continuously increase, Palestinian rights decrease, and Palestinian men, women, and children die without any public notice until war breaks out. Our nation must intervene to end this violence before more innocent people die. Stop aiding and abetting the occupation and start applying the values of universal human rights to all victims of oppression, no matter what their nationality is, their skin color, or religion. Now, it's really important to understand, too, that we need to first end the violence. Ceasefire is one of the main things that is happening right, right now. The United Nations resolution that Riyadh just mentioned, you know, there was a hundred and... I think a, it was a majority, I think 120 nations against 18 were in favor of the res, uh, resolution to cease fire and to bring humanitarian aid. That says something. The United States was one of the few that were against. Canada didn't say anything. So one of the things that we're asking for, um, right, the ceasefire now, the Biden administration must take the lead to establish a ceasefire negotiations and the apartheid-style occupation of Gaza and work toward a just and enduring peace for the Israeli and Palestinian people. All reasonable people want this violence to stop. And a permanent stop to the violence starts with recognizing the decades of occupation and apartheid that has occurred with the Israeli government. Now, another very common 
theme that I wanted to mention was, you, and a lot of resistance that the community might see when you are attempting to stand up for what's happening right now in Palestine, is a lot of people may call you anti-Semitic. You know, um, recently this weekend, we saw a huge demonstration in Grand Central Station. Uh, thousands of people coming together to call for a ceasefire. Jewish Voices for Peace led that demonstration. So let's not call this anti-Semitic when many, many Jewish voices are saying, not in our name, not in our name. And, it, and it's out there in the news. So equip yourself with knowledge. Know the core things that we're asking for. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to get into some more basics about knowing your rights in general when it comes to political discussions. Uh, the first one is the First Amendment. First Amendment of the United States. Oh, thank you. Oh, so much better. Thank you. So the first part of knowing your rights is the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. I'm sure the right to freedom of expression, including partaking in the world is seen. Um, I think it's and we see public outrage rise to know your rights during this time. Now, we also have to know that the First Amendment right is not absolute. It has to differ based on time, place, and manner of activity. So it depends on where you are and what you're doing. You don't have the right to express yourself anywhere. You can't be at your job unless you work for care and express uh, you know, to political discourse, because it's not a right in your workplace. It's a private place of um, employment. And so your employer has the right to dictate what you say and what you do during your type of work, right? So those are the, one of the th important things to know is about the First Amendment. And though, yes, it is there to protect us, uh, it's not completely absolute. Now, all types of expression are usually product protected in public forums like parks, sidewalks, streets, and other areas where the public has been granted office, um, granted access, like in front of government buildings, for example. Uh, for example, we had a huge protest this weekend in San Francisco. Brother Riyadh was there. And the one in San Jose at City Hall. These public places are great places to demonstrate and ex um, express your dissent about what's going on right now. However, you also have to understand that, you know, there's limitations to that. So uh, the protests at Grand Central Station this weekend, for example, they arrested about 400 people. Why? For civil disobedience. They caused a huge stoppage during rush hour traffic. So that gave the police officers cause to arrest several people because they were not enabling traffic to go forward. So there's things like that that are important to understand. So especially when you have young ones with you and, you know, maybe some elderly which are also coming out to protest, it's really important to understand these things to keep yourself safe. Another one is private property owners, however, are permitted to dictate their own rules that may limit free speech. Again, your private employer or a private property, I think, you know, a lot of people Having demonstrations in front of congressmen, um, the homes of congressmen, for example, and they're getting arrested that way as well. So we need to make sure that we express ourselves at the right time and the right place. So another thing to remember that the right of uh, freedom of speech can extend to defamation, obscenity, and threats, more, more so threats if you're looking in the public. Um, so if you're in the public, you know, and you start threatening somebody and start fighting, obviously that gives cause for authorities to uh, try to apprehend you and stop that. So we don't want to give them a reason to do that. We're here, um, millions and millions of people peacefully protesting what's going on. Uh, so you have the right to protest, but so do other people. 
So also know that if you are out at a protest um, for anything, your freedom of speech also means that counter demonstrators, counter demonstrators are also afforded the same thing. You know, they can say what they want to say, but remember, when they go low, you go high. You know, you just can ignore them and continue doing what you're doing. Megaphones and bullhorns may be used. Uh, permits are required for music and drums and things like that, but always, if you're organizing or in a protest, try to know what the local um, permits are. Let's see, and when you're in a public space to photograph anything in plain view. So that's like a really big one. Plain view is anything that you have like in a public space where you don't, are not expected to have. <clears throat> oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. I was really straining there for a second. Okay, so um, you're in a protest, right? Um, you need to know that while you're in a protest, if you go there, other people also have the right to protest, right? That's part of being a, in a public space. Uh, the right to have people videotape you, that's something that's allowed in a public space because there is no expectation of what we call privacy. Now, if it's in somebody's home, that's illegal. You can't um, videotape somebody without their consent. But in a public space, you can. So that's very important to understand. Another thing is that police officers may not confiscate or demand to view your photographs or video without a warrant, nor may they delete data under any circumstances. So that's really important to understand in this day of social media when we're seeing things live. However, they may order citizens to cease activities that they determine are interfering with law enforcement operations. Um, I don't think that you know, taking a video of something that's really important for the public to know is disruptive. Now, um, another important thing to know is when you're at these demonstrations, what happens if the police stops me? First of all, stay calm. You have your rights. Make sure to keep your hands visible. You don't want to make any sudden movements. Don't argue, resist, or obstruct the police, even if you believe that they're violating your rights. Um, if you are protesting, point out that you're not disrupting anybody else's activity, right? At, like at Grand Central Station, they, you know, took about 400 people and put them in arrest because they were disturbing the peace, right? They were causing traffic to stop. Um, and name your First Amendment rights. That's always really important to assert your rights whenever you're in a situation like that. If you're stopped, ask the officer if you're free to leave. If the answer is yes, just calmly walk away. Now, if you are under arrest or detained, you have the right to ask why. You usually say you wish to remain silent and ask a lawyer immediately. Um, you don't have to explain anything, honestly. Uh, you, you should use your right to remain silent because sometimes things will be used against you later and put out of context, and that's not a wise thing to do when you're in that type of situation. So do not say anything or sign anything without a lawyer. Very important to note. We have many people who call us at CARE with that exact same situation. Law enforcement officers are at their door. The FBI is asking for an interview. And what do we tell them? Don't say anything and lawyer up. Another thing that's really, really important to know is that you net you never have to consent to, search your, uh, to the search of yourself or belongings. If you do explicitly consent, it can affect you later in court. So just basically say, you know, plead the Fifth Amendment. I have the right to remain silent. I need my attorney. And then also, I do not consent to this search. Police may pat you down if they suspect that you have a weapon. That's why it's really important if anybody stops you to Keep your hands visible at that time. Keep phone numbers on your person in case you're detained or arrested. You can put um, care in your phone. Uh, and Or you know, if you have an attorney or a trusted advisor, somebody you can, um, you know, an emergency contact like that, keep that in your phone as well. If you're arrested for an infraction and you have a valid ID on your person, the police must give you a ticket and release you on the spot unless you refuse to sign. 
Now, what happens if you believe that your rights have been violated? When you can, write down everything that you can remember, including the law enforcement's badge and patrol car numbers, the agency that they work for. Very practical advice if you ever get in any kind of situation, you know, at a demonstration, or, you know, if, if you're just driving down the street and somebody targets you because of the color of your skin, or they, or they just, you know, want to ask you extra questions that they don't need to. Always remember what the incident was, what time did it happen, when did it happen, where did it happen, who did you talk to, get contact information of anybody who may have witnessed that. Social media is also great, everybody's recording things these days, so if you see that somebody's recording a video, get it from them. Take photographs of any injuries you may have received, and once you have all this inf uh, information, you can file a written complaint with the agency's Internal Affairs Division or Civil Complaint Board. Sorry guys, I'm, I have a lot to cover. <laughs> Are there any questions so far? Okay, great, great. So now, you know, we're, we're in a really difficult environment where we're having a lot of protests. We have, we have a lot of people who are actually being fired because they come out in support of Palestine and against the uh, the killing of innocent civilians as an unequal, uh, inequivalent attack against civilians is not self-defense. Um, so a lot of people are getting slack from this within the Muslim community. People in your school, for example, uh, you know, at your work, you may also face the same issue. Um, you know, we've had university professors uh, who have gotten fired because of their asking for ceasefire. We have, you know, school teachers who are asking, who are being asked to sign um, statements saying that they won't oppose Israel. You know, we have school districts right now that are coming up in support of Israel. It's it's getting really dicey, and so it's really important to know, you know, what you can do. And, and where you can go for the help that you need. Um, for example, let's start off at school. I know we all have children. We want them to be safe. We want them to not have to go through this. But the fact of the reality is, as a Muslim growing up in America, sometimes you will have to deal with these things. So it's better to arm yourself with the knowledge that you need in order to make, your, make sure that your child is safe. Um, for example, many community members have received emails from schools and universities, right? Um, like I just said, with one-sided comments supporting Israel, these statements fail to acknowledge the dispossession of the Palestinian people under illegal Israeli occupation um, or their humanity as they're bombarded and killed by Israeli forces. So, you know, we know that these statements are upsetting and hurtful, but we should also know that they're, we're out there. We shouldn't be caught unaware when it comes to responding to these things. CARE has actually taken the time to develop letters that can be used and downloaded um, to send to your school at university, and so you can use this as a powerful tool to re even if you want to respond with a letter or use it as a template when you're speaking to somebody, I think it's a really important tool to know um, as a Muslim parent and convey that to your children. So another big one is the workplace. So a lot of us are, you know, unfortunately uh, facing discrimination in the workplace, getting fired, not getting opportunities. Um, at certain universities because of their stance, uh, because of, you know, their stance against genocide. It's really a shame, but it's happening. Yes, and a lot of the things that I'm referring to right now are on our website, CARE, SFBA, uh, the Palestine Toolkit. So a lot of this information that I'm talking to you about is there. Um, all of these uh templates and letters exist there for you. So please do take advantage of them. Download them and just save them, you never know. Um, so at the workplace, another big thing is um, the First Amendment does pro protect private sector employees from being fired and it applies to government entities is the problem. So the First Amendment 
doesn't apply to your employer necessarily, right? It only applies if, like, it's a, a government entity. Like, so if you're, you know, at work and it's the government or if the government is the one who's, like, funding a program, right, and they discriminate against you, then that's when the First Amendment comes into place. And while Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act covers six protected categories, including religion, sex, race, and politics, it's important to know that political expression is not included in that, not in the state of California anyway. So that's important to know, right? We have this First Amendment, right? We have civil rights, the Civil Rights Act, right? But political speech is not necessarily covered on that. However, uh, California does have a law um, where an employer, uh, which keeps an employer from discriminating against an employee for political activity and affiliation. That's Labor Code 1101 and 1102. Um, and so this prohibits employers in California from setting any policy that prevents employees from engaging in political activity. For example, you know, I mean, this has happened in Nicaragua all the time, like, oh, okay, well, you, you're coming to work, you have to go vote for this political party. So if, if anything happens like that at work and they say, okay, you're not allowed to go to this protest, you have to sign this agreement, like many teachers in Texas are having to sign agreements where they um, agree not to go against Israel, um, that, you know, if it was in California, we could bring up this Labor Code 1101 and 1102. Also, employers cannot attempt to control an employee's political activities by threatening to engage in retaliation. Right, uh, retaliating in any way against an employee for his or her political um, beliefs and activities. Um, also, you know, you can fight that that is wrongful termination as well. So, you know, within this whole umbrella of rights, we have a lot of gray area. We have a lot of circumstances, right? Because, you know, employers have also, in California is an at-will state, which means that an employer can fire you for any reason. Right? So there's there's a lot of different competing things, but the most important to know, thing to note if that does happen is that you need to write it down and you need to um, send them a certified copy of it and file a notice with them. Another wonderful thing that CARE has on its cool kit is a download of a letter to an employer where it cites the law and it tells them what your rights are. So that's another thing that you should try to empower yourself with. Um, yeah, would you like to cover hate incidents? Um, no, no, that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, so hate incidents and hate crimes. Um, so, you know, uh, right now the level of Islamophobia has gone up. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, many people within the community have experienced violence. Um, Immediately what comes to my mind is uh, Wadia Al-Fayyum, who's a six-year-old boy who was murdered, um, him, a uh, Palestinian, and his mother almost died, um, stabbed to death by a man, you know, who thought that a young boy was a threat. So, you know, these hate incidences, these hate crimes are on the rise, so we want you to protect yourself. So at all times, be vigilant and be aware of your surroundings. Uh, travel in groups when possible and make sure somebody knows where you are. Uh, De-escalate also is really important. You know, we see that happening at a global scale. Everybody's asking for de-escalation. We should also practice that in our daily lives. Uh, what to do if you experience or witness a hate crime? First, uh, get to a safe place and seek support. Um, document the hate incident and crime. So in this digital age, it's really important to document everything, take time. And the great thing is that if you have a phone and you take a picture, if you don't remember where you were, you can just look at that picture and say, okay, it was December 3rd at 2.30. So that's another easy way to document, date and time, snap a picture. Uh, be upstanding. If you see someone experiencing hate, step in. Um, if it's a safe thing to do, but don't intervene physically, please keep yourself safe, of course. Um, and report any incidences of hate to the local police and care. 
even if it's just words and not necessarily a crime, you know, um, there's lots of gray area there. There's like, for example, the hate crime may not necessarily be physical violence. It can be an environment of intimidation. And also it creates a record. So uh, 101 lawyer, 101 is always create a record of everything. You always have to keep that um, and then ask for legal help and then give your attorney your documentation. And then really important, do not engage, do not retaliate, don't name call. Um, don't feel embarrassed or ashamed. It can often feel awkward and uh, a little, I guess, alarming when you're faced with a hate crime, you know, and you see it there. Um, but when you have the knowledge of something beforehand, I think that's powerful. Oh, and so that's it for now. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm going to pass it to Usman. Yeah, really briefly, I'm going to hand it to Riyadh, um, really quick, just for a few uh, more words. Just, before. just cut me off when you want to. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot that I'd like to say, but the truth is this is not the best time to say it. So I'll just you know, put whatever I can out there until Brother Sman tells me, uh, give me back the mic. Um, one thing that uh, Sister Lena had mentioned earlier was not to engage at protests. Um, this is actually something that um, I want to just spend literally seconds on. If you have somebody who is against the protest, against the rights and the plight of the Palestinians, or, or whatever it is that you are out there uh, promoting, uh, I would not engage with them. And the reason is um, it doesn't serve any purpose. Uh, it truly does not serve any purpose. If anything, you could find yourself in a hole or a legal battle. battle. Um, people who do this, I honestly think it's a calculated effort to, to, um, to, see, to see if you can fumble in your words, to see if they can have you become reactionary or become emotional. And I think it's very important to ignore because we're not there to debate. We understand what the truth is. We understand what the reality is. We don't. We are not in the business to trying to. We're not in the business of trying to convince some person who advocates or justifies or is silent about the mass murder, the ethnic cleansing, the genocide that's taking in Palestine. Why would you want to spend a second trying to talk to somebody about that? Uh, that's not the place or time. You're there to exercise your voice and in support of your Muslim brothers, not to entertain some clown uh, who might have a very high voice. Um, and always, and, and it, it always reminds me of uh, a great quote, quote by uh, Desmond Tutu, who once said, I think, to his son, and I hope I don't get this uh, quote wrong. He says, um, you know, don't increase the volume of your voice. Uh, increase the substance of your argument. So it, it's, I don't think it serves any purpose. Uh, it doesn't, we should not dignify any uh, clown who wants to ruffle our feathers at any organized gathering. Um, real quickly, um, as uh, a Palestinian living in a Palestinian household and an activist household for all my life, I've always seen, I've always in, uh, uh, anticipated watching interviews, hearing, do you condemn this? Do you condemn, always, always beginning in the conversation. It's always a condition. Uh, things have changed. For the first time, I'm seeing now academics and uh, uh, government officials um, on both sides, Palestinian and non-Palestinian, uh, turning that question around. Because it, it, it is a form of psychological warfare. Because it finds yourself uh, coming from behind and not starting on an equal plane when you are trying to discuss what, what is happening. And uh, there is no shame to it. The Western media is consistent doing it even to this day as I sit here on this table if I see another interview when I go home tonight it's going to be do you condemn the very first thing you know it's funny because if you brothers and sisters are asked the same thing or or put in that same situation uh, this is what I'm telling my kids you know this is what I'm telling my friends uh, 
who might not know about the plight of the Palestinians, but then again, um, they're learning very quickly, not by choice, because I'm informing them. Um, if somebody asks you, do you condemn? I, first of all, I would answer, well, first of all, I'm, I, I'm not a part of Hamas. Um, I, I don't live in Gaza. I'm not an official spokesman. So I don't know what you're talking about. But clearly, let's say the person who is asking you is a supporter of Israel, and that's why he's asking you, do you condemn Hamas? You should say, well, clearly you're the one who supports Israel, so let me ask you, do you condemn home demolitions, uh, mass bombardment of innocent populations, forced evictions, uprooting of olive trees, uh, apartheid that is recognized by pretty much uh, the, the, the whole entire world now? Do you condemn Israel for the past 75 years of killing, maiming, um, forced home evictions, uh, arbitrary checkpoints, the humiliation, the, the, you know, the, uh, the disgraceful treatment of the Palestinians. Clearly you're a supporter of Israel, so tell me, do you condemn 75 years of that? When you, when you have the, uh, the courage to condemn such treatment, such a history, such a narrative, then you have earned the moral authority to ask me if I condemn Hamas. But only until then, don't ask me if I condemn Hamas. And by the way, Hamas is, is no grassroots organization. It's documented, it's public knowledge. Hamas was created and funded by Israel. Alhamdulillah. I'm glad, glad to see the uh, escalation of the um, points and the uh, tone here because granted what I will say, I'm usually calm, collected, much like my colleagues who have been here, but the truth and the reality is my blood is boiling. Um, probably like most of you, I would imagine like all of us, wherever we are, whatever we're seeing, whatever we're experiencing, your blood um, should be boiling. Um, and I will say, I will also preface this by saying before talking about actual community safety and some of these strategies, literally 24 hours ago, maybe even less than 24 hours ago, for all of us that tune in on social media, Instagram, Twitter, wherever we get our news from, um, I'll mention Dr. Talat Jahan Khan, uh, 54 years old, the mother, pediatrician, mother of two, um, brutally, brutally murdered um, in Texas, sitting outside her apartment or in her apartment complex, just sitting there, unexpected, not knowing, not knowing what to, um, what is about to happen. So what I want to do and what I want to inform us in the short time that I have is to build this general awareness and to really, you know, assess where you are, what your safety is, what it looks like, what your options are, wherever you might be, because the reality, brothers and sisters, the reality is regardless of where you are, no matter where it is, school, the bus, the store, wherever it might be, um, the potential for a risk or for your safety um, to experience something happening, a hate crime, an incident of harassment or bias, it's higher than ever. So. I'm gonna walk us through a little bit of um, what de-escalation may look like in a few, before we broke out for Isha, um, I had briefly mentioned, and I'll run through this again really quick, some, some of the information that I shared, but when thinking about community safety, I wanna preface, preface, it, preface it again with what just happened and what we've just um, seen, as many of us are on social media, Twitter, Instagram, um, all of that. Um, we, we saw um, the headline for Dr. Tala Jahan Khan, um, a mother, a pediatrician, you know, a mother of two who was unaware. Um, she was sitting in her apartment complex, um, just sitting on a picnic bench, and she was attacked um, from out of nowhere um, and brutally, brutally murdered. And this um, isn't the first instance of hate, um, of harassment, bias, hate crimes that we have seen um, over the past three weeks or so exponentially they are growing and they are continuing to affect everybody and not just and it can happen anywhere i'll say again it can happen in school um, with your kids it can happen um on the store on the bus public transit wherever you might be so my brothers and sisters for all of you some general info really work um and be aware of your surroundings and be aware of where you are what's going on and i know a lot of us already are 
A lot of us have that built into us. I know I do. Um, a lot of us already are hyper aware of our environment, of our exit routes, of who's around us, who's talking to us, who's there, wherever we might be. And I don't want to build paranoia or any of those feelings for anybody, but I do want to say as general guidance, it is more than important to know where you are and who you are with and what your surroundings look like. So I want to talk a little bit in terms of community safety about something called bystander intervention. Um, and we lead this training across the country um, quite a bit uh, myself, but I want to say this specific uh, information is especially around um, these verbal instances of harassment, bias, hate that we have seen. And I'll start with those steps and then we'll also look at some of the more complicated and more um, additional strategies that I'm able to provide for all of you. And the reality is in these 10, 15 minutes that I have with you all, you're not going to get everything down. You're not going to be um, understand everything fully, but you'll have these conversations and you'll have this general knowledge in the back of your mind so that when you are in a high intensity situation or you are you know, worried about your safety, that you have some actions at your disposal and you'll be able to protect yourself, your family, and anybody else that is around you. So really quick, I want to run us through some basic steps for, especially for verbal um, interaction and engagement. So with that in mind, right, the first step that I'll cover really briefly is assessing your environment, assessing your situation. So I've already mentioned a little bit of being aware of where you are, who you're with, who's around you, what is going on. And I want to add a little tidbit that I tell, especially the kids and the students that I work with everywhere. I wear headphones pretty much everywhere. I'm listening to a podcast, my Islamic lecture, whatever it might be. Um, and those, those AirPods, especially the Apple ones, they're noise canceling. So do yourself a favor, do everybody a favor, keep one in, keep one out. That way you can hear, you can listen to what you're playing, what you got going on on your phone, you can kind of tune into that. But you also have a little bit of leeway there because you're able to hear and kind of be involved in the environment that you are around. So by all means, do what you want to do, take care, you know, take care of that, but also be aware of your general environment. So that's assessing the situation and assessing what's going on. And then the second big step that we talk about is what it looks like to get others involved, especially as a bystander, right? So really briefly by a show of hands here, how many of us have heard of something called the bystander effect? Anyone? No? One of us? Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, I'll give a quick definition for us. So the bystander effect, a psychological phenomenon where the more people that are, that are there to experience or witness an event happening, the less likely any of them will actually be to step in and to help. And the reason this happens is because as humans, a lot of us naturally disperse our responsibility onto the people around us. So in this case, if I notice somebody who may be getting yelled at or maybe being harassed somewhere, I'll look around and I'll see other people here, other people witnessing this, and I'll tell myself, hey, it's not up to me. Somebody else will step in. Somebody else will give um, a call to a security guard or the manager or whatever it is. Somebody else will get involved. So why would I do it? Um, but the reality is, is that you have the power to give and return people's responsibility back to them. And that is by getting them involved and doing something really easy, like giving them directions on what to do. So directions, they don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be really um, intricate. It could be something as simple as, hey, Riyadh, do you see what's going on back there? Do you see what's happening? I think that we should get involved. Can you maybe um, take a video of what is happening so we have some documentation, we have some proof, we have some evidence? And maybe, Lena, um, is it possible for you to tell somebody, tell the people behind us, tell the bus driver if we're on transit, tell the security guard in the store, the manager, employee, whoever it might be. So by naturally, by giving folks directions, you get them involved, and it can be easy, especially for those of us who may feel a little less comfortable being the ones to step in and actually intervene and actually be there. It's a really easy way to get other folks involved um, in this situation. And at the end of the day, your numbers, a lot of the times, um, are really important for safety for not just yourself, for that person that's being targeted, and also for the people that are around you. So that's our first two. And then we look at what intervening calmly um, looks like. So 
unlike the way I feel right now with my blood boiling and my anger um, and my emotions at an all-time high, I would say it is important in the direct moment, in the high-intensity moment, that you really keep calm and collected and take a second for yourself to process what is happening, what is going on, um, and then from there, once you get others involved too, you actually intervene calmly. So that could be something really easy, walking up to that person who may be being harassed here, introducing yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be by name. Um, it's up to you if you want to use your name or not. But for instance, I walk up to somebody and I could be like, hi, uh, my name is Usman. I've seen what's going on or I see what's happening. I would like to be here with you to support you. Is it okay if I maybe sit next to you? And then you can strike up a conversation. Um, sometimes you don't have to introduce yourself that way. Sometimes you could just start a conversation or a dialogue like you know them. It could be, I like your shoes. I like your, I like that shirt. Um, or, you know, I noticed the art that you have. You know, that's really cool. Like, we talk about it. Something as simple. To make it clear that you're there, not as somebody that's going to make their life more difficult. You're going to be there to support them. And you make that very clear. And that is also important with something like nonverbal cues here. I know that oftentimes in our life and around us, there can be a language barrier, especially if it's somebody that we do not know or that if we're in public. So think about something like, especially us as Muslims, I think a lot of our first reaction when we see someone, when we greet someone, is something as simple as a hand over the heart. And that's really important because that shows and that implies um, that you're there for somebody, you're there with peace, you're greeting them with blessings, right? And that you're not there um, to pile on, especially because that person that might be being targeted, that may be experiencing this, they're already have their sentence, their their senses heightened. They're already on guard, might be defensive. So you don't want to um, you don't want to ruffle their feathers even more here. So that's um, intervening calmly, and you also just some general knowledge, um, asking for permission if possible before um, doing anything. Sometimes folks will say they don't need your support or they don't need your help that you're okay to, you know, they can handle it on their own. And that's okay. Um, you can respect that, respect their agency. But what I will tell you and what I will advise all of you is if somebody tells you that in the moment, you can let them know something super simple. You could say, hey, that's okay. Um, you know, that's all right. But I'll still be here in the background or I'll, we'll still be here um, a little bit of a distance just in case something happens or just in case um, we are needed or anything is needed for us to provide support. And that way, again, it's very reassuring and something super easy for you to do and for your party to do also. And then why this is important is because when we're looking at uh, bystander intervention, especially at this verbal harassment level, which is really common, which we all have seen, as my colleagues have already mentioned um, quite a few times, right? Don't engage with that person. Don't engage with whatever nonsense, whatever hatred, whatever vile, inf whatever vile opinion that they are expressing and harassing somebody with. That is not our role. That is not what's important. What's important is that you are there for that person that is being targeted, and you are there um, in the vicinity with whoever you are that you are with, and you're there to provide support. So whatever it is, even if they escalate verbally, whatever it is that they say they're trying to provoke you, they're trying to get a response out of you, a reaction out of you, don't give them any, don't give them any of that. Don't buy into it. What you can do and what is more valuable is you focus your energy, um, your effort, and your support on that person that is being targeted. All right? You can talk to them directly. Continue to talk to that person. Continue to engage and build dialogue with that person that's being targeted. Um, and I'm not saying to turn your back um, entirely on someone, especially because you know it's, it could be in public. You don't know what they might have on them, what their intentions might be. But I will say um, that to focus your attention on that person that's being targeted, and you know, really um, hone in there. And um, also, a lot of times, other instances that you can include here are also things like creating a, a physical barrier if need be with more people and kind of isolating that person out of this situation. Because the reality, you know, I can't run through um, the way I would normally do a training where I have us all act this out, or I have us all walk through a variety of these scenarios. But as you can imagine and kind of think about in your head as you walk through this scenario, if you isolate that person out of here, um, they will feel less inclined to continue. And they'll essentially talk to what's, what's kind of like a brick wall, basically. You ice them out of this scenario. and. That's the major steps here. Um, and also, 
like my colleagues have said, right, resources continue to support people, something that you can offer, um, continue to be there for that person, um, especially as things de-escalate um, around us. And that's really quick. I know that's not, you know, a very, it's not a whole training, a whole two hours plus, but I do want to continue with more general info because I think while this is important and an important strategy for us to have, the reality is, is that we need as much um, support and we need as much kind of education and knowledge as we all can get for us to be prepared and for us to kind of act accordingly, especially in the heat of the moment. So I do want to cover um, something else that I think is really relevant, especially for a variety of instances. And this could also be relevant for those kids that are in school and seeing their friends being bullied or seeing people around them that are being harassed for whatever it is, um, especially now with um, folks speaking out and being more and more vocal about Palestine, which is good, which is needed. Um, we're also seeing that people are feeling more inclined um, to attack um, other folks for their opinion and attack them for being on the right side um, of history and of our times um, today. So I do want to cover some additional strategies, and we call these the five Ds of de-escalation. Other folks call them the five Ds of uh, bystander intervention, but there are five really helpful um, tips that I'll provide to all of us. And again, nothing is black and white. Nothing is concrete. Everything is, you know, circumstantial depending on what we're experiencing, but these strategies are really helpful and really help you think through um, what de-escalation might look like. So that first D of de-escalation, distract. Sometimes a really subtle method of intervention that can shift the focus of some of the harassment of the incident um, by disrupting it. So that could be something really easy like spilling my drink um, on purpose, but it creates a distraction, creates something to shift the attention, the focus on something else, and allows that person that might be being targeted to kind of leave the situation and get some safety and create some general distance. Um, and this is also the strategy that I mentioned where you can pretend to know the person that's being harassed. I'm going to act, you know, kind of excited um, to have randomly run into that person as well. So a distraction a lot of times could be really helpful. And then delegate. I've already mentioned this, but get others involved, right? And give them directions. To make them return their responsibility and their agency back to them that they should be acting. You see what's happening over there. I think we should be acting now. Riyadh, can you maybe take a video? Lena, can you get tell the folks behind us, tell the bus driver, whoever it might be? And then again, more uh, basic information, but documenting everything that you've seen. Write it down, record it. Take a video, take a picture, have evidence of everything that is happening, whatever it might be. It could be very valuable um, here. And that's kind of what secondarily intervening is called also. That strategy of recording video or picture evidence of what is unfolding in front of you. And a lot of times that could de-escalate a situation in itself. I know a lot of us that are on social media, we saw that Barbecue Becky incident happen in Lake Merritt, right? A white lady harassing a black family trying to have a barbecue on Lake Merritt, just living their life, being you know, enjoying a normal day, and she was harassing them. When folks started videoing her, started putting her on blast that way, she ended up backing away, shying away, um, and backing down from the scenario because she didn't want her any kind of documented evidence. Um, of her harassment and of her behavior. So document everything um, that you can. And then there are other two strategies that are um, valuable too as well. Um, delaying um, a situation sometimes. Um, you know, this is again just general support. Can help to reduce someone's immediate trauma by talking with them or offering resources and maybe even offering if you can walk with them um, to their direction or to their destination, sorry. And then also the last point um, that I'll mention really briefly again is just uh, I don't recommend this everywhere, um, but you can be direct with folks sometimes in our different groups, in our different social groups um, that we may, may be in. Um, sometimes being direct with that person can actually de-escalate the situation. But again, I wouldn't recommend that um, in like somewhere random, somewhere in public that you might be, especially with somebody that might be harassing you. I always recommend this generally around people that you know or in those social circles um, also. So that's some important tidbits on what de-escalation could look like. And again, that's very brief, very fast. But I want to say, just kind of thinking through this and envisioning this, have this conversation with people that you're around, 
um, you'll be able to talk about de-escalation and what it might look like. But I don't want to stop there. Um, what I want to finish off with is an important um, tidbit of information that many of us have been wondering. Many of us have been thinking how I feel powerless, I feel helpless, I feel like I have nothing that I can do. But the reality is, even us here, um, you know, in this digital age of media with all the resources that we have, you have a number of ways that you can get involved and make an impact. And that is through direct action for all of us. Young, old, student, uh, worker, whoever you might be, direct action works. Direct action is important, and I'll lay this out for you in three really simple and easy ways for you to think about and that have been guiding me, especially as I feel uneasy and as I have felt powerless and helpless. But I remind myself these points because they keep me going and they keep me motivated, and I would like to do the same as a reminder for all of you. So the first really simple and basic way that I'll lay this out is strengthening your iman. I am not a sheikh, I am not, um, I'll preface that I'm not a sheikh, I'm not a khatib, but I'm a you know, child of immigrants, Muslim parents, I'm a Muslim myself, student of deen, and I will say the first, that's the easiest thing that we could do in this moment. Um, strengthen your iman, return to Allah, pray, make dua. These things are really valuable and these are really important for us to keep our perspective and to stay grounded and to provide support from wherever it is that we are. Very, very valuable and I can't emphasize that uh, enough because really we need to control what it is that we can control as humans and in this moment. So we can control how we present ourselves, how we pray, how we you know, talk to Allah, how we make dua. We can control these things. And also be a part of your community. Be a part of what goes on. That's here at MCC East Bay, wherever you are from tuning in from. Be a part of what happens in your community. Attend your masjid, attend your youth programs. Be involved in what's happening around the news, around your community. It's very important as we continue to talk about what support looks like you need to be there for your brothers and your sisters i can't emphasize that enough because truly um, it is like a strength in numbers game right we have a voice we have the power and we have the ability to come together and to support one another and at a time like this that is needed more than ever so be a part of your community and really again strengthen your iman take those steps for yourself and secondly Again, learn your history. Super simple, something that you can do at home. With, we have more resources now than any time in history. And it's all right here in your pocket. Literally, you have access to more information than probably most of our ancestors ever did um, throughout their lives. And I would say learning your history means your own family history also. Most of us, children of immigrants, immigrants ourselves, refugees, we come from backgrounds of colonization, of this um, occupational backgrounds, whether it's Pakistan, India, most of the entirety of Africa, South America, wherever it is. Us as immigrants, a lot of us have these similar um, backgrounds as well of occupation, of harassment, of um, colonial um, struggles. So learn that history, learn how your ancestors, and maybe not even your ancestors, but how in those times folks came together, how they, de how they um, decolonized, what they did, how they resisted. This is important because this is not something that's isolated uh, from all of our histories. This is something as Muslims and something as immigrants, children of immigrants, that means something to us. This is our history as well. And also learn about what's going on. Brother Riyadh um, mentioned a little bit of what's happening in Palestine, but educate yourself um, on the history here. Not just what happened in the last month, last few weeks. Learn about the history of occupation and of the struggles and the colonization of the region and of Palestine. Learn about these. They are doing teach-ins and sit-ins, educational programs all over not just us at CARE, other organizations. We have the luxury, especially here in California, of having access to these programs and to these resources. So learn that history um, from the start and educate yourself on it 
and have those conversations with your classmates, with your friends, with your parents, with your children. Have these conversations and explaining to them of not, you know, of not backing down and really talking about um, what's happening and why we should be tuning in, why we should be protesting, why we should be active, why now more than ever we cannot sit at home and just be silent and just pretend like things are going to resolve themselves or that we have nothing that we can do. And I would say a quote that I read um, that I think is really important and I'll echo to y'all here too is that your ancestors did not resist colonization for you to remain silent and for you to live in that luxury of silence because silence is complicity, my friends. So be involved, say something, speak out. And that is the final point that I'll mention. And I'll wrap up with this point too and kind of tie everything together for us. Be involved in more direct action. That means protest. That means be a part of these community movements because your voice matters. And that is something that nobody can take away from us. We have the power to come together. We have the power to be involved in these struggles and everything that we can. And I'll mention again, um, a really, really, um, some folks might call it contested, um, other folks might call it controversial. It doesn't matter, it works. Um, learn about boycotting. Learn about something like BDS, boycotting, divestment, and sanctions. Learn about these organizations and their strategies because Islamic history and also just general history, like for the civil rights movement and other times, boycotting um, has been incredibly valuable and is a way because most folks, the reality is, care about money and they care about the power that comes with that. So boycotting is a way that you and I and our families can get involved. And I'm not saying to boycott every single brand because then the reality is we won't be able to survive, but you can start with three really easy ones, all right? Start with uh, what we've already been doing. Companies like Starbucks, um, Disney Plus, McDonald's. Those are three really simple and easy things to boycott. And then we can work our way um, to other groups and other um, resources as well. So focus there and learn about the history of something like BDS. And why I say that's controversial is because in a lot of states, uh, more than 28 of them, they have specifically mentioned BDS um, being extensively banned in their legislation. And that's not an accident. What you learn is that the reason why this is banned is simply because it works, because it's effective, because it actually creates power and creates um, an opportunity for change. And that is how you and I in this corrupt system that we are in can really make an impact also. So it's kind of twofold, right? Being involved in these different movements and also um, showing economically and financially that we will not buy in to any of the corruption and to any of um, this um, you know, occupation. And I will say again, um, not your imam or not your khatib. I'm just a brother in the community, like all or you know, like most of us. But I will say, um, you will probably have a lot of uncomfortable conversations, a lot of uncomfortable conversations with coworkers, with classmates, with um, whoever it is that you might run into. But so what? We need to be vocal and we need to be together and rise up and you know, not back down. It is our duty, it is our responsibility to stand up for what is right and for what justice, And because Islam, at the end of the day, is a religion. Yes, it's a religion of peace, but it's also the religion of justice as well. And I'll mention really quickly um, Surah Taha for all of us. Um, in that surah, um, it talks about Musa salam and his experiences, and what I'll mention for us is when Musa al-Islam called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, whether it was him going to face the Fir'aun, whether it was him facing the magicians of that time, or him standing in front of the water with nowhere to go and his people behind him and being cornered by the, um, the military, Allah had always reassured him and started with that revelation saying, La taqaf, la taqaf in every verse there. And la taqaf means do not be afraid, do not fear. And I say that same advice to all of us. Do not fear um, those uncomfortable conversations. Do not fear what is going on. Stand up for what is right because Allah reassured us of this. Allah reassured us um, that, you know, 
that we are supported, that we have this backing, that we have the guidance that we need. It's, it's are reassured for us. And those are really three simple and easy, um, easy things for us to get involved. And I'll run through them, really just name drop them. Um, the first one, strengthened in your Iman. Second one, learning your history and learning the history of the plight of the Palestinian, our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and being involved um, in direct action. And the final drop that I'll quote, or that I'll quote and end with here, um, is just another verse um, from the Quran and some more guidance. But it's makru wa makarullah, Allahu khairu al makirin. Um, and I apologize for my pronunciation, um, but I will say they plan and Allah plans, but Allah is the greatest of all planners, uh, my brothers and sisters. And I'll wrap up what it is that we hosted here and what our talk was like, but I do want to make space. I know we have folks um, on a live stream. We also have folks here in person. So I want to make time for questions. Um, if folks have some, please feel free. Um, and know that you have resources at your disposal, us at CARE, other orgs. Um, I can't name drop every single one, but there are a lot of resources, especially here in the community. So if anybody has questions, do you have access to the live stream by chance? Okay, no problem. Um, if not, I'll wrap up with, if any of my colleagues wanna say um, any final words, um, if not, uh, my name is Usman. Again, um, we run the programs at the Council of American Islamic Relations, San Francisco Bay Area. I want to thank you all for tuning in and for giving me this platform to speak. And again, I'm just a brother, just a member of community like the rest of us. And I want to say um, to get involved, to be take action, and don't let anybody silence you. Thank you. Oh. They're still on? Okay. <laughs> well, I hope they heard that then. Yeah. Is there any questions? No, no. They just oh, they're wondering. What I was, um, for the brothers that were here in attendance, I was, I was explaining to them the use of words and how words uh, convey a lot of meaning, a meaning and uh, how they affect the narrative and how the story is told. We are told that there is a conflict in Palestine. And I've told the brothers here that I submit that there is absolutely no conflict. There is no conflict. Did we call the Algerian and the French situation a conflict? No, we called it what it was, a brutal occupation and which took the lives of one million Algerians in order to gain their freedom. Did we call it a black and white issue? In South Africa, no, we called it what it was, a racist apartheid regime. So what do we have here in Palestine is a genocidal uh, government that is ethnically cleansing the indigenous population of Palestine. It is not a conflict, it's an occupation, it's an apartheid. And so brothers and sisters, when you encounter these opportunities where you might be confronted voluntarily or involuntarily to talk about what is happening. Understand that words have meaning and they have an effect. And so look for those words, you know. When you watch the news tonight, of course, as we all have witnessed, many Israelis were killed, but Palestinians seem to die. They just die. They're not killed, they, they just die. So it's these little things these racist ways of describing one population against the next that affects the way people think, especially the person who not, might not be educated about what is happening. And of course, we all know that ignorance, there's no short of ignorance in this world. And if we don't have people informed, if we do not allow people to understand the true story of what is happening in Palestine, the same history will be doomed to repeat itself. So th that's kind of what I was speaking with the brothers here uh, in attendance, that the language is another uh, f front, I would call it in, in the information war. Information war, which I think we have a lot uh, of ground to make up. But we should start at home. When we educate our kids, when we explain to them that our fellow brothers, our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters in a different distant land 
or suffering. I don't think it's something that we should do. I think it's, as in Arabic, the word is wajib. It's a duty. It is a duty. Because, because I submit that if the whole ummah, the whole Muslim, Arab, and non Muslim population of the world do not stand up and recognize what is happening to the Palestinians, then I will submit to you that the rest of the Muslim world will suffer the fate of the Palestinians. And one might argue that that is already happening, that it is already happening on some level. So do not think that what is happening in Palestine does not affect you. It will. It will. And this world is becoming a much smaller place, a much smaller village every day. And so uh, with that, um, thank you. And I'll just um, add on a little bit to what Riyad so eloquently um, shared. A lot of this is psychological, right? It's these kind of like fear tactics that people um, who have this some form of authority are trying to impose onto y'all. So don't waver. Don't um, back down. Like Riyadh said earlier when they asked you, do you condemn um, the actions of Hamas? Well, do you condemn um, the illegal occupation and the killing and the brutal genocide and ethnic cleansing that has been happening? Um, ask these questions. Continue to engage in dialogue that way and don't allow people to psychologically torment or control the way that you view um, what the reality is and what the actual real facts are here, right? And just something again that he mentioned, um, it's linked fate. What happens to one group, what happens to one, whether it's a religious group, it's an ethnic group, um, it is, you know, racial racial group, whatever it might be, the reality is what happens to one group could very easily happen to the rest of us and to our own communities, to our own people. So that is, again, all the more important why we need to educate ourselves and why we cannot allow people to silence us and allow them to control our narratives and the way that we view and um, uphold ourselves and our communities. And um, again, a little um, Islamic guidance, like the Prophet um, had mentioned um, that the Ummah is one body. And so what happens to one part of the Ummah, the rest of us feel, and the rest of us, regardless of where we are, regardless of what um, our connection might be, we feel that pain and we feel that struggle. So again, with everything that we've laid out, it's all the more important for us not to allow the rest of the world to write us off or to make us feel like we don't have any kind of power or any kind of influence. That's not true. And you have the power through direct action, um, which we've already kind of went through. And I did want to take a sec um, to hand it to Lena here. Uh, we had a question um, online um, that she wanted to go ahead and answer and provide some more guidance for and maybe Riyadh and I can um, jump into if need be, inshallah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Usman, for your um, encouraging words. Uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, many of us in our community are feeling that pain, right? That pain of the ummah. And so during this time, please do take care of yourselves. It's really important to have some self-care, to have some boundaries with the social media. Um, I can say it, but it's harder to do. I know, I know. But please do care for yourself and your kids. Um, you know, right now in this time, I feel like what causes me the most pain are the children that are dying. Um, so I guess this is kind of a segue to the question that I've uh, got here. Question, do you have any advice uh, for protection and vigilance while working at a Muslim school? Now, you know, I feel like if you are at a Muslim school, you're probably at a place where you don't have to face as much public censure as you do in private or in public schools. Um, that's why we have the anti-bullying report, or we have the bullying report that CARE does every year. And this is for schools, right? It's meant to, you know, as a reporting mechanism. Um, for children who are in public schools, but I think that many of these principles can also be applied in this context, right? Because our kids, they don't know sometimes that they're being bullied. They don't understand what's going on and they need to be educated because bullying doesn't just happen in the school context, right? It happens at the grocery store. It happens playing basketball outside with your friends. It happens in any context. 
uh, many contexts, you know, that children find themselves in the playground, for example. And so it's important, I think, if you're working in a Muslim school to have educational programs about bullying. Like, what is it? How do you target it? How do you know that you're being bullied? Um, and also, like, important to note, social media is really important because that's where a lot of bullying occurs. And so, you know, m trying to monitor um, social media, maybe even having presentations at your school. You know, Usman does great bystander intervention training that can also apply to the bullying context. Uh, so that's really important as well. And, you know, know your rights presentation like these, you know, our children are young, they're smart, and they understand a lot more than we give them credit to. So I think it's important to educate them as well. If you're in a Muslim school, you have that ability to really be a voice of truth, right? You understand what's going on right now in the conflict. You can even talk to the children about what they may see in CNN, what their friends and colleagues may be seeing. It, it creates a sense of cohesion and I think it's really important and, and a wonderful opportunity to work at a Muslim school because you have that um, ability to, to um, teach these children skills that they might not get elsewhere. I'll, I'll give it to Usman and Riyadh for any comments. And just one final drop. Um, online, ca.cair.com. Um, that's CARE California's website. You can click on our office, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and literally the first big banner that you see on our local website, or even on any of the websites for the California team, it'll be the, this Palestine um, resource guide or this toolkit that has everything that we've talked about today. So letters to your employers, um, protections for school, for bullying, um, your rights when protesting, all this information, all this documentation, it's all published for everybody to access. So I would highly, highly recommend that you take some time to look at it and take some time to go through it and also just bookmark it um, on your browser or bookmark it on your phone. That way, just in the chance that we might need it, that you have access to it and you're able to look through it. It's there for you. It's there for the whole community. Um, and you know, I highly recommend to use that. And it's not just us from CARE. Other organizations also have these resources that are published too. I highly recommend our colleagues all around. Um, they do. Everybody's committed to the work. Um, and alhamdulillah, use these resources. Like I said, we have access to more resources than our ancestors probably did throughout their lives. Literally, our phone has everything on it. So use it for good and use it for knowledge and education um, for yourself. And Riyadh, did you have any final words? If not, um, I think we do have um, one more question. I think um, the question is, um, how do we navigate a scenario where a teacher is showing pro-Israel propaganda to young children? I've discussed it with the teacher, but she has been framing it as religious history um, and curriculum. And I think, Lena, did, if you um, want to answer that uh, for us with a little bit of background here, I think you probably have a little more um, advice and knowledge here. Uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Usman. Uh, so how do we navigate that difficult scenario where you have a teacher um, that's the one spreading pro-Israel propaganda? You know, in that particular case, we have a power imbalance, right? We have the children and then we have a teacher who's doing this. I think that the next st obvious step to take is take this up with the school. I'm not sure if you have. Um, but definitely, the, there needs to be a report that's made. Um, and I know that we've actually, CARE has actually dealt with this uh, similar instance before. Um, so first, you know, there needs to be a report that first you need to notify the school. Usually it needs to do in, you need to do it in writing. writing. Um, and depending, you know, on the circumstances of how many times this may have been, you know, it's always important to get other statements from kids or parents that may have heard similar things from their kids, you know, so that you can substantiate it, right? Because a teacher, she's not being recorded while she's teaching children. So it's important that you um, gather your evidence, substantiate it, talk to people within your community, um, and hopefully the school is willing to address it. Um, however, we know 
uh, from recent news that many schools are actually coming up with pro-Israel statements themselves. So then at that point, it's important to go to the next level, right? So that's when you get the school district involved, and that's when you get organizations like CARE involved. You know, that's part of what we do. I myself am not a civil rights attorney at CARE. I'm in the immigration department, um, but I know that there's a lot of work that goes into that. There's a lot of um, mediation sometimes that happens between different organizations at the school who have a voice. And sometimes, you know, a school is a place where that dialogue can happen. And so there's there's a lot of different things that can happen um, in that scenario. But of course, first and foremost, try to talk to your child about it. Um, tell them, you know, that uh, there's a lot of different stories that are being told in the media. And not all of them are true. And not to feel uh, disempowered by that. To support them. Because I've even... That even happened to me when I was young, you know, and teachers will tell you certain things like take off your hijab, things like that. Um, so it happens quite often, you know, not all teachers are perfect. And so we need to address the situation. So I want to say a couple words. Um, I, I work uh, directly in the civil rights department and without um, identifying the parties involved, I will say that th things do work, uh, like Brother Usman has mentioned, direct action works when you utilize the proper resources. Um, we, have, we have a family that contacted us recently um, because their school superintendent, and there are many superintendents, not just one, uh, that have been putting pro-Israeli statements out with choice adjectives to describe Palestinians. No surprise. You know, and before I tell you what happened, I just first of all, I just want to say real quickly, I find it absolutely outrageous and curious that somehow all of a sudden in, in the United States of America, school administrators have now, it's like they added a new task to their job description, and that is taking a, a side in the the brutal occupation and genocide of the Palestinian people. I mean, I don't understand. You know, why, why, why are they, uh, well, actually, I know why. Um, but I just find that amazing that they've taken it upon themselves to uh, take a position on what is happening. And what's even more outrageous is the fact that they're speaking out in, in favor of Israel is causing a climate that is making our children unsafe and afraid. And I am not just saying that. I am directly involved with speaking to parents and kids who are afraid of going to school because of the statement that's been put out. They are the sisters. Some have been reportedly taking off their hijab because they are seniors and they are concerned about whether their admissions uh, into college next year, inshallah, is going to be accepted. And, uh, and after that, employers, because now of what's been happening in Harvard and the, uh, the attempt to intimidate those Palestinian law students. Um, so there is a real climate that's causing fear with our children. It's it's real, and I've I've seen it, and I and I'm currently dealing with it. Um, so back to my point, though, these parents reached out to us, and we provided them with what we had available at that moment, and they utilized some resources that we had, and they sent it to the superintendent. Uh, letters that we had prepared that would make it look like it's coming from them, uh, really well written. And as a result, they were given a meeting, an audience with the superintendent. Uh, superintendent had apologized and had said that he had meant no harm or, or did not want to create an environment that was unsafe for the kids. So that's just words, but actually this particular individual uh, followed it, followed through by sending out to the district a second letter, revising what he said the first time, and to the satisfaction 
of the uh, Muslim parents, they were happy with the second letter, uh, a more balanced statement. Um, so thing, that was direct action that these parents were empowered. Uh, we told them to speak. We gave them the resources that they could use so they could advocate on behalf of themselves and their children. So things do work. There are wins. There are many wins. But the idea is to be consistent. And the idea is to always speak the truth to power. The idea is never to sit down and to think this does not affect me or my household. Uh, n never, never, you know, th they say in this era, truth is a controversial thing. Well, that's, I think that's a sad statement. But I just want to let everybody know that, w w that I can always speak for myself and for my household, for my children, I tell them they must always keep their head up and always speak the truth. Um, you know, arm them with the history, arm them with their rights. Let them know who has their back, that you'll always support them. Let them know that we live in this country and that the law is for our benefit. It's not against us. Well, if you see something happening, report it. Don't try to hide from it. Uh, you know, we have the freedom to speak out here. Uh, Sister Lena had described those situations that you need to be concerned about speaking out, but essentially outside of, the, outside of the workplace, we live in a free country where you can say what you want and sometimes even push the envelope. You can say what you want. I believe that, I think a lot of the uh, the, the doubting, the self-doubting comes from perhaps if, and this is just my opinion, maybe from the more recent immigrant community. So I'm saying now to those who might be recent immigrants, you have more freedom than you give yourself credit for that you think you know. You have the right to speak. It's not a crime. Um, because if you're silent, it does two things. It either means you're complicit or, unfortunately, it means you empower those who intend to marginalize our voices moving forward. We must always learn that speaking out is the, mo the most basic thing we can do. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I just wanted to share real quickly that small win that I've just been made aware of this past week where the Muslim family now locally is like, thank you, but I, we no longer need assistance because we are satisfied with the outcome of what's been ha what, what has happened. So, uh, yeah. Jazakallah khair again to everybody um, that attended, for everybody that tuned in. Um, and from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.